Chapter 8, Section 2. What was the social context of the statement laissez-faire? The honeymoon of interest between the early capitalists and autocratic kings did not last long. Quote, The self-same monarchy, which for weighty reasons sought to further the aims of commercial capital and was itself aided in the development by capital, grew at last into a crippling obstacle to any further development of European industry. Rudolf Rocker, Nationalism and Culture, page 117. This is the social context of the expression laissez-faire, a system which has outgrown the supports that protected it in its early stages uh, of growth, just as children eventually rebel against the protection and rules of their parents. So the capitalists rebelled against the overbearing support of the absolutist state. Mercantilist policies favored some industries and harmed the growth of industrial capitalism in others. The rules and regulations imposed upon those it did favor reduced the flexibility of capitalists to changing environments. As Rocker argued, no matter how the absolutist state strove in its own interest to meet the demands of commerce, it still put on industry countless fetters, which became gradually more and more oppressive. It became an unbearable burden, which paralyzed all economic and social life. All in all, mercantilism became more of a hindrance than a help, and so it had to be replaced. With the growth of economic and social power by the capitalist class, this, re replacement, uh, this replacement was made easy. Enrico Malatesta notes, The development of production, the vast expanse of commerce, the immeasurable power as assumed by money, have guaranteed the supremacy of economic power over the political power to the capitalist class, which, no longer content with enjoying the support of the government, demand that government arise from its own ranks. A government which owed its origin to the right of conquest, Though subject by existing circumstances to the capitalist class, went on maintaining a proud and contemptuous attitude towards its now wealthy former slaves, and had pretensions to independence of domination. That government was indeed the defender, the property owner's gendarme, but they had the kind of gendarme that they, who thinks that they are somebody and behave in an arrogant manner towards the people that they have to escort and defend when they don't rob or kill them at the next street corner. And the capitalist class got rid of it and replaced it by government and state at all times under its control and specifically organized to defend that class against any possible demands by the disinherited. Malatesta here indicates the true meaning of leave us alone or laissez-faire. The absolutist state, not the state per se, began to interfere with capitalist profit-making activities and authority. So they determined that it had to go, as happened, for example, in the English, French, and American revolutions. However, in other ways, state intervention in society was encouraged and applauded by capitalists. It is ironic that main protagonists of the state, in its political and administrative authority, were the middle-class utilitarians on the other side uh, of whose statist banner were inscribed the doctrines of economic laissez-faire. E.P. Thompson, The Making of the English Working Class, page 90. Capitalists simply wanted capitalist states to replace monarchical states so that the heads of government would follow state economic policies regarded by capitalists as beneficial to their class as a whole. And as development, uh, as development economist Lance Taylor argues, quote, in the long run, there are no laissez-faire transitions to modern economic growth. The state has always intervened to create a capitalist class, and then it has to regulate the capitalist class. And then the state has to worry about being taken over by the capitalist class. But the state has always been there. In order to attack mercantilism, the early capitalists had to ignore the successful impacts of its policies in developing industry and a store of wealth for future economic activity. As William Lazenick pointed out, the political purpose of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations was to attack the mercantilist institutions that the British economy had built up over the previous 200 years. In his attack on those institutions, Smith might have asked why the extent of the world market available to Britain in the late 18th century was so uniquely under British control. If Smith had asked this big question, he might have been forced to grant credit for it to the very mercantilist institutions he was attacking. 
Moreover, he might have recognized the uh, integral relation between economic and political power in the rise of Britain to international dominance. Moreover, what the British advocates of laissez-faire neglected to talk about was the role that a system of national power had played in creating conditions for Britain to embark on its dynamic development path. They did not bother to ask how Britain had, had attained the position of the workshop of the world, while they conveniently ignored the ongoing system of national power, the British Empire, that continued to support Britain's position. William Lasnik, The Business of Organization and the Myth of the Market Economy, pages 2, 3, and 5. Similar comments were applicable to American supporters of laissez-faire who failed to notice that the traditional American support for worldwide free trade is quite a recent phenomenon. It started only at the end of the Second World War, although, of course, within America, military Keynesian policies were utilized. While American industry was developing, the country had no time for laissez-faire. After it had grown strong, the United States began preaching laissez-faire to the rest of the world and began to kid itself about its own history, believing its slogans about laissez-faire as the secret of its success. In addition to the tariff, 19th century America went in heavily for industrial planning, occasionally under the name, but more often in the name of national uh, defense. The military was the excuse for what is today termed rebuilding infrastructure, picking winners, promoting research, coordinating industrial growth, as it still is. As Richard DeBoff um, points out, the anti-state backlash of the 1840s onward in America was highly selective, as the general opinion was that, quote, henceforth, if governments wished to subsidize private business operations, there would be no objection. But if public power were to be used to control business actions, or if the public sector were to undertake economic initiatives on its own, it would run up against the determined opposition of private capital. Accumulation and Power, page 26. In other words, the state could aid capitalists indirectly via tariffs, land policy, repression of the labor movement, infrastructure subsidy, and so on, and it would leave them alone to, a, to oppress and exploit workers, exploit consumers, and build their industrial empires and so forth. So the expression laissez-faire dates from a period when capitalists were objecting to the restrictions that helped create them in the first place. It had little to do with freedom as such and far more to do with the needs of capitalist power and profits. And as Murray Bookchin argues, it's an error to depi depict this revolutionary era and its democratic aspirations as bourgeois and imagine uh, in imagery that makes capitalism a system more committed to freedom or even ordinary civil liberties than it ever was historically from urbanization to cities, page 180. I can't even begin. Takis Futopop, uh, I'm sorry, F-O-T-O-P-O-U-L-E-S, uh, in his essay, The Nation State and the Market, indicates that the social forces at working in freeing the market did not represent a natural evolution towards freedom. Quote, contrary to what liberals and Marxists assert, marketization of the economy was not just an evolutionary process following the expansion of trade under mercantilism. Modern, i.e. capitalist markets, did not evolve out of local markets and, of, uh, and or markets of foreign goods. The nation state, which was just emerging at the end of the Middle Ages, played a critical role creating the conditions for the nationalization of the market and by freeing the market, i.e. the rich and proto-capitalists, from effective social control. Society and Nature, Volume 3, page 44 and 45. The freeing of the market thus means freeing those who own most of the market, i.e. the wealthy elite, from effective, uh, from effective social control. But the rest of society was not, uh, not as lucky. Kropotkin makes a similar point in Modern Science and Anarchism. While giving the capitalist any degree of free scope to amass his wealth at the expense of the helpless laborers, the government has nowhere and never afforded the laborers the opportunity to do as they pleased. <coughs> the one essential form of support the libertarian right wants the state or defense firms to provide capitalism is the enforcement of property rights. The right of property owners to do as they like on their own property which can have the obvious and extensive social impacts. What libertarian capitalists object to is attempts by others, workers, society as a whole, the state, etc., to interfere with the authority of bosses. <coughs> that is, 
just the defense of privilege and power and not freedom. So, Samuel Johnson once observed that, quote, we hear the loudest yelps from liberty, for liberty, among the drivers of Negroes. Our modern libertarian capitalist 